Hey, what's up guys? Bajiri here. Now for this video, I've got some games that I had with Venruki and Sidu playing Warrior Mage Healer. Now we played some of these games as Fury Arcane Resto Druid and then a few as Arms, Holy Paladin, Fire, and then a little bit of Frost. So it was a really fun session and I definitely wanted to bring you guys some commentary and walk you through the action. So this game was up against a Boomkin Resto Shaman Shadow Priest and in the opener, I'm gonna fear the two DPS, Stormbolt the Resto Shaman and do as much damage as I can with Battlecry, Avatar, Odin's Fury, etc. before getting cloned. So, even though they shut down my burst with that Cyclone right there, we forced the Adaptation Trinket on the Boomkin, the normal 2 minute Trinket on the Shadow Priest, and the enemy Resto Shaman's Astral Shift or their little Shield Wall damage reduction. So, we have every reason to continue to train this guy, and that's exactly what we do. A lot of times fighting Boomkin, Shadow Priest, Resto Shaman, it feels like you have to keep them on their back foot because once they get comfortable with Earth Shield on tanky DPS, getting their triple heal system rolling, allowing the Boomkin to free clone, the Shadow Priest to get VTs rolling, and the Shaman being able to just sit back with Earth Shield on whatever target you're hitting, and basically healing with Riptide only and staying at full mana the whole game. So one way to force some pressure is to make those kind of swaps to the enemy team Shaman. That being said, once they begin to stabilize from that swap, the Shaman gets topped off, he gets peeled or whatever, gets Earth Shield on himself, you don't really want to allow the Shadow Priest and Boom can free ran over the battlefield. So you're going to see us pull back a little bit, start to hit a DPS, Venruki and Sidu really have to work together to stay alive, whereas for me, as a Fury Warrior, I feel like I'm pretty safe in this environment. If things get really, really rough, I can always pop my heals, but at this point, I'm really just trying to peel for Venruki, allow Sidu to get some heals rolling, and basically just get ready for our next big damage opportunity. So, Venruki's able to land a full sheep on the enemy team Shaman, which once again, I'm not able to fear both DPS here, but I am able to fear the Boomkin once again, because he's the one who's primarily responsible for peeling me with Cyclones and stuff like that, so... This opens up another opportunity for us to swap to the enemy team Shaman, and you're going to see me pop tons of cooldowns on him, take a brief moment to kill the Sky Fury, line the first Cyclone, reflect the second Cyclone, and take out the Shaman, along with Venruki's Arcane Damage. So against teams like Shadow Priest, Boomkin, Resto Shaman, and Demonology, Boomkin, Resto Shaman, a lot of times I think that swapping to the healer really helps keep them out of their comfort zone, kind of speeds the game up a little bit, especially if you're able to CC the DPS on your offensive pushes. So this next match is going to be against the Shadow Priest, Demonology, Warlock, Resto, Druid. And this is a composition that definitely can be tanky, go for the long game once again. So we're going to follow a similar principle of trying to use our damage in a way that throws them off their game and never really allows them to just sit back and cast on us. So in the beginning here, Venruki really wanted to go on the Resto Druid, but since he was able to get Bear Form off before my Fear, I wasn't really able to do a whole lot to him in Bear Form. Once he Gates, however, and gets out of Bear Form, that's when I'm looking to catch him in a stun and unleash my Burst. So we're able to do a whole lot of damage to him here. He's able to Shadow Meld right as the Infernal Stun hits me, so I was not able to get the Raging Blow that may have finished him off. After that, he's able to get Iron Bark, get his Hots rolling, and get out of Dodge. Fortunately, Sidu is able to blink after him, catch him in a half bash, and cyclone him at the very end of his Iron Bark. And you'll notice as I was chasing the Resto Druid, Venruki was getting the Shadow Priest down to about half health, and Sidu landed a clone on him to deny any sort of healing and keep him low health. So, the Resto Druid's in a cyclone, the Priest retreats behind the pillar and then pops back out to the safety of the Fell Lord, but that's definitely the target I want to hit until we can swap back to the Resto Druid, perhaps. Like I mentioned in our last match, healer swaps can definitely be effective, but you don't want to allow casters too much free time to get all their dots rolling. We are going to try to make another swap to the Resto Druid, but as I leap over, he's already in bear form predicting the swap, so I do a little bit of damage to him here, but since he's already in bear form, it's really not worth investing a whole lot of offensive cooldowns into that, because I already know he's going to really not take much damage. As a bit of a consolation prize, we did get thorns out of him, and they also showed us that they were using Siphene, which means the Shadow Priest does not have Void Shift available to him. So that's one less defensive cooldown at their disposal. Instead of popping my cooldowns into the Resto Druid, I'm just going to go ahead and fear him in bear form and unleash some damage on the Shadow Priest. This Druid is spending pretty much this entire game in bear form, so it's really hard for us to land any sort of sheeps. So instead of stunning the Shadow Priest, one of the things I could do is look for the opportunity to stun the Resto Druid when he's out of bear form, and also be more patient with my fears, because any chance you can catch this Druid out of bear form, you either have the option of casting a Polymorph into him in caster form, 
or just using that Storm Bolt to swap to him when he doesn't have that big bear form damage reduction. So even though I didn't use my cooldowns 100% ideally, we were able to force Iron Bark onto the Shadow Priest when I popped my offensive cooldowns, so we can do a little bit more damage to the lock here and just keep pushing them back, keep swapping with Hots, and keep them on their back foot. This Druid, like I said, pretty much never leaves bear form this entire game. He's just wallowing around, backpedaling in bear form. Just hoping that his hots can do the job. And fortunately for him, Demonology Warlocks are exceptionally tanky, so we're not really getting a ton of damage done. I am able to land a Stormbolt on the Druid when he's out of bear form. Unfortunately, we're not able to follow it up, but the combined damage of offensive cooldowns from a Fury Warrior and an Arcane Mage can get a lot of work done. So we drop the lock to a little bit above 20% health and force his Shield Wall and Iron Bark. Also notice that his pet died in the massive cleave damage that we did. So as soon as Iron Bark and his Shield Wall fall off, without the damage reduction of Soul Link, that lock just falls over. And one of the fun things about Fury Arcane is that there definitely is some CC available to us, but we also have so much offensive pressure that if we're able to get rolling, we can carry that momentum to a victory, even if we're not really able to land as much CC as we'd prefer. And this next match, we were queuing in the morning, so if you guys don't know, queuing in the North American region in the morning sometimes doesn't result in the sort of best queues. So we had to wait a little while for this game, and sometimes when you wait a while, you end up facing teams that are a little bit lower on the ladder than you are. And this is just a kind of a funny example of just how much damage this comp is actually capable of. So <laughs> they didn't really fully see that coming. All I really did was run over and fear the priest, uh, come back, stun the hunter, pop on my cooldowns, and uh, catch him in a massive Odin's Fury that just wiped him off the map. But that's kind of a fun example of what our comp is capable of when you catch people a little bit off guard, perhaps. And now we're fighting a double and a holy DK, holy priest. Did I mention we were queuing in the morning in North America? So this is the kind of stuff you see when you queue early in the day. So I'm gonna leap over there. The priest did have his little holy ward thing up, which means that he gets to immune any CC that hits him, so definitely not my best use of fear there. But I'm still going to try to make the most of it. Chuck a Storm Bolt, that'll land full. Meanwhile, doing damage and trying to peel this unholy Legion army that is chasing after Venruki. So we're basically just going to try to hit one of these DKs as much as we can, and I'm just going to be spamming Piercing Howl and throwing a little bit of AoE to knock down this army, even though Venruki does get a lot of damage bonus hitting multiple targets as Arcane. And it's not a huge deal, but just taking a peek at my DPS, I'm doing about 220k. Um, that's after AoEing two entire, you know, undead armies from Unholy DKs, and that's about as much damage as Boomkins do in a 3v3 arena with only three targets, I'm pretty sure. So you can just imagine the damage a Boomkin does, it's just a fun fact. While we're wailing away on this DK, I'm trying to catch a Storm Bolt on the Priest out of the Polymorph, but you'll notice he has a half a second to get his Holy Ward up, and he does, so my Storm Bolt gets immune there. So I usually try to be pretty careful about not overlapping CC too much, but at the same time, you also want to make sure that you're not leaving too many gaps in CC, because that's when healers are able to use abilities that, even if it's a very, very short window of time, can save their team. So that Holy Ward made a huge difference. Things like uh, getting off a Spirit Link make a huge difference. So to keep that in mind is that overlapping CC is not good, but you also don't want to leave gaps. And while we're just wailing on these DKs, I do want to give you two small pieces of advice with respect to CC chains and not leaving gaps. So two things is that one, you might sometimes want to save a global to make sure that you can get the CC off that you need. Because if you press an attacking button and then you go to press your CC button, however, you know, you're on global and they're able to get out of CC, that's going to leave a gap. Another thing is Stormbolt has a travel time. So if there's about like a second left on that, sometimes you're going to want to go ahead and chuck that Stormbolt a little bit early to allow for travel time. Now, that Stormbolt in particular, I actually waited for a Holy Ward to fall off. As soon as it fell off, I chucked that Stormbolt and we were able to land a full sheep. I'm going to pop my offensive cooldowns, force IBF on one of the Death Knights, AMS on the other Death Knight, and Ray of Hope from the Holy Priest. So we just got a lot of cooldowns out of this enemy team. And if you're not familiar with what Ray of Hope is, let me give you a quick description. For the next six seconds, all damage and healing dealt to the target are delayed until the ability ends. Meanwhile, all heals are buffed by 100%. So it basically locks the target's health for six seconds and then tops him to full health. Keep that in mind for the next game. Anyway, so my job, like I said, is to have Piercing Howl pretty much up 100% of the time. So not only are the Death Knights slowly lumbering after Ven, it's also the pets who aren't able to get there and get damage done. Because if these Death Knights do connect, they can be pretty scary. All right, so I chucked the Stormbolt at that Priest, but there's another ability that the Priest can use to help him avoid CC, and that's Greater Fade. So with Greater Fade up, that's gonna make my Stormbolt miss him, 
Fortunately, I am able to land the pummel out of that, so that's a little bit of lockdown on the Holy Priest, but it's also a few abilities that he can no longer use to avoid CC himself. So we're going to land a full bash onto the Priest, a Cyclone out of that, and pop a ton of cooldowns on this Death Knight, which is going to force IBF, and then as you'll see in a moment, Ray of Hope. So once again, that's forcing a ton of cooldowns out of this enemy team, but they are able to survive our push, so now it's our turn to try to survive theirs. Venriki drops down about 10k health, which is terrifying, but I'm just going to do my thing, spam some Whirlwinds, spam some Piercing Howls, and use that fear on the DPS once they get Vortexed back in. So, I think I definitely could have positioned myself to land the fear on the Priest as well, but I really wanted to make sure that we survived that situation, because I think that we are going to be able to win this game in our next offensive pressure, which is right now. So Ven is able to pull the enemy DKs across the map, behind the pillar, get them down to half health, and then I can follow up with my cooldowns, and the Priest really isn't able to catch up after mind controlling me on the other side of the map, which basically put himself in a full CC while Ven was bursting the Death Knights. Then Sidu followed up with a Cyclone as I leaped over, popped my cooldowns, and finished off the DK. So that was kind of a sketchy match, and definitely some learning experiences with Holy Priest CC avoidance, but at the end of it all, we got the job done. And a reward for a job well done is fighting the same team once again. So this time, my fear does not get Holy Warded, and I'm able to land it full. We're not able to follow up with any other sort of CC, but I do see that he's using Aura Mastery and Fade on this Mind Control attempt. So I decided to be really patient. Stormbolt the Mind Control at the end of the Aura Mastery, pummel the Mass Dispel so that Ven can stay in his Ice Block a little bit longer, and then just hammer the Priest as he tries to Mind Control once again. This is going to force Ray of Hope on himself, which is one less cooldown to use on these DKs who are getting evaporated by Ven. With all these cooldowns forced on the Priest, I kind of just want to chase him and see if I can keep him away from his DPS here. So I did a really good job holding my pummel in the beginning here, but he's able to sneak a fade in there, fake my pummel, and top himself off while Ven Ruki is sitting around half health. So I'm just going to slow him as he's trying to get back to his team and see if I can't peel a little bit with some piercing howls. Once again, I'm really glad that I was disciplined and patient with my first Storm Bolt and Pummel on that Mind Control MD combo, but unfortunately, I Use my Stormbolt right into the Cyclone that Cedar just cast. That's one less cooldown that we have available to us. A little bit of a waste, but you can't get too hung up on that. I'm going to disarm the DK, pop cooldowns of my own, try to cleave these guys down a bit, and see if we can't force a few cooldowns out of that Priest once again. He's definitely running out of cooldowns at this point. I charge over there. The Priest is forced to fake his heal, so he wasn't able to get as, nearly as much healing off as he wanted to. And I'm taking a look at what I've got left. I've got a Stormbolt, which I'm able to chuck over there, land full, no Holy Ward, no Fade, which leads into Sidu being able to blink across the map and land one of the Cyclones that really determined the game for us. So this Death Knight is below 20% health, has to retreat. I'm able to land a Rampage and drop him down to literally 1% health. So the Priest is able to land a Ray of Hope, and I unfortunately fear right into his Holy Ward. And with Fade Up, I'm not able to Stormbolt him either. But Sidu, thinking fast, lands a Cyclone on the Ray of Hope proc meaning that the DK gets zero healing from that. Venruki locks the Priest on the MD, and I finish off the Death Knight with an Execute. So that game had a few sketchy moments, but the beginning and the end were pretty freaking cool. <laughs> so this is one of our games as Arms Fire Holy Paladin, facing off against the Turbo Cleave. So as Warrior Fire Mage Holy Paladin, I definitely think that we should beat the Melee Cleave, but Turbo is really scary in the amount of burst it can bring, and I feel like I'm probably, honestly, a little bit rusty at Arms since I've been playing primarily Fury. Fury is a blast, I just know that Arms Fire Holy Paladin is a really, really good comp, so it was good to get a little bit of practice in. So honestly, as the Arms Warrior in this composition, I feel like my main job is to peel from my Fire Mage while dealing as much damage as I possibly can. What I think makes Arms Warriors good in a 3v3 arena situation is the fact that we deal really consistent damage while bringing a lot of kind of small offensive slash defensive cooldowns to the table. For example, Sharpened Blade. When we don't have CC, filling that gap with Sharpened Blade is really, really cool. I talked about this a lot in my Arms Warrior PvP guide about how you can use Sharpen to either start, finish, or sort of make up for the gaps in CC. We also have little defensive cooldowns like Duel. So you're going to see me duel this warrior. While I'm hitting him, I'm going to deal full damage to him, but as long as he's not hitting me, he's going to deal half damage to every other target. So that can either force him to hit me or make him just deal less damage to Ven. I also have Disarm, so basically every time this Enhancement Shaman pops Bloodlust, I'm going to Disarm him. You can also Disarm the Warrior, but a Bladestorm gets you out of Disarm, so I don't think it's like the best use of it. But the Shaman definitely isn't going to be dumping Stormstrike procs in my mage during that Disarm, so 
I tend to throw the disarm on the enhancement shaman more than anything. So they're kind of getting that picture. I'm, I'm dueling them often. The mage is cutting them, so they're going to turn to me and force my parry because I'm pretty low on health. Definitely want to make sure to kill Wind Fury totems when you're facing Turbo Cleave. If you leave those Wind Fury totems up, you're just giving them free damage, and they can also stack if you leave them up for too long. So you got to keep that in mind. One of the things you can look at is that little CC chain there. We landed a full sheep into a fear. As my fear was ending, I went ahead and used Sharpen, which allowed Ven to land one more sheep, but without the monk being able to really get any sort of healing off in between there. So maybe a little bit early in the Sharpen, if I knew that Ven was able to land another sheep, maybe I would have held it. But on a 25 second cooldown, I feel like you can afford to be a little bit liberal with your Sharpen blades, as long as you're not just kind of using them randomly. But honestly, even if you use them randomly, I bet it's still scary for the enemy team's healer. <laughs> So even though Venruki's trying to do his best to kite these two melee DPS, they are both able to get some pretty serious uptime on him. I see the Wind Fury totem on the ground. I'm going to go ahead and kill that instantly. Feel the Lust coming. Disarm the Shaman as soon as that Lust hits. Venruki's able to Dragon's Breath the Warrior off of him. So he's pretty much peeled. Me, in defensive stance, I'm a little bit tankier, but these two melee DPS swinging on me is also a little bit scary. So I'm going to use my Heroic Leap to get across the map, continue to line and slight the Shaman and the Warrior while Venruki lands a full Sheep on the enemy team's healer. As that sheep is ending, we're able to land a hodge. Out of the hodge, I'm gonna make sure I sharpen blade to deny any sort of heals on this enhancement shaman. Unfortunately for us, both me and Ven are super low health. We land the kill on the shaman, and I turn to disarm the warrior, but he's able to charge right past me without my disarm going off. And since I hadn't been disarmed the whole game, I'm pretty sure he was just using the charge execute talent. So even if I had landed the disarm, I'm pretty sure the execute was actually what made him charge, so it wouldn't have done anything. So now we are faced with a 2v2 situation, and fighting a Mystery Monk in a 2v2 is not all that much fun, but we're going to stick it out, try to make some plays happen, and see if we can't get this win. So after a few minutes of running around and a few stacks of dampening, we're going to start to get some pressure on this Monk. A lot of what we're trying to do is land full Hodges into DR Stormbolt into Sharpen Blade. So we talked a little bit about uh, not letting CC gaps occur, in the last matchup and we did let a little cc gap occur which is what allowed that monk to get that cocoon off so just to imagine for a moment what that would have looked like if we landed the full hodge into stormbolt with no gap into sharpen blade immediately after that cocoon would have been hardly anything combined with dampening and the increased 50 percent mortal strike from sharpen blade that would have been even more of a scary situation for that monk so just one one more thing to keep in mind guys every match is a learning experience every everything is a chance to get a little bit better and i think that's one of the things that i'm going to focus on moving forward is especially as warrior mage is making sure that cc chain is airtight now we're going to land another full hodge on the enemy team's monk and since i'm hitting the warrior he's going to actually have to parry as soon as i see that parry i'm swapping immediately back to that monk because i want to make sure that i can keep my damage rolling as much as possible because this deep into dampening damage is really pretty much the main deciding factor because heals aren't really doing that much at this point fortunately for us the monk is going to run in to try to land cc on the both of us but having the monk up close and personal is exactly where I want him to be. I'm going to disarm the warrior to try to mitigate some damage on me. We're going to land a full hodge under this monk. I'm not going to take any chances. I'm going to go ahead and sharpen blade immediately after the hodge. Land a fear just to, as like a little mini stun. Land a stormbolt out of that and finish that monk off. So once again, not the prettiest CC chain. But I really didn't want to get interrupted on my stormbolt attempt. So I just wanted to go ahead and sharpen blade basically with one second left on that hodge just to make sure that if he did escape he wasn't going to get any heals going at all may as well use that fear <laughs> just as like a stun as well so definitely didn't want to lose that 2v2 fortunately we were able to pull it out and get that win against this tough turbo cleave now this next match is up against that same demonology warlock shadow priest wrestler Druid that we had fought before as fury arcane but this time, we're playing Arms Frost. So as Arms, I definitely don't have as much self-healing as I used to. But as Arms Frost, we probably have a little bit more consistent damage stacked with that all-important Mortal Strike and even scarier Sharpen Blade. So I'm going to open up with a Fear, followed by a Stormbolt on the Resto Druid. The Lock is going to jump down and pop his Shield Wall, and I'm going to Sharpen Blade that immediately. Could have waited on the Sharpen Blade a little bit until the Druid was in line of sight, but Sharpen Blading the remaining hots the Lock had during his Shield Wall meant that he pretty much didn't receive any healing, and the Druid is going to have to invest resources refreshing his hots. So after our opener, the enemy team is just going to set up a defensive position under the bridge next to the pillar with their Fell Lord. This is going to allow Venruki to cast Blizzards and get his Frost Orb back quickly as possible. While we wait out the Fell Lord, we're going to do some damage to the Warlock's pet. He's just going to summon another one, but it's always good to just keep damage rolling on something, because you never know if the Lock is going to realize their pet is dead or not. 
And as you saw in that first match when we were playing Fury Arcane, a Demonology Warlock without his pet takes a ton more damage and gives you an opportunity to land a kill. We're all gonna jump down together, Hodge the Druid half, and try to get some damage rolling during this. I feel like I'm really getting CC'd a whole lot and not getting a whole lot done. Finn is charging up his Frost Burst and keeping these guys on the defensive. Once again, when I play Arms Warrior, I definitely feel like I maybe have a little bit more consistent damage. I have a few more tools in my arsenal to try to peel for my team, but one of the things I don't feel like I have is that, you know, feeling of safety. Arms doesn't really have any self-healing, and it has basically only parry on a three-minute cooldown, so you gotta pretty much sit in defensive stance when you're anticipating taking damage, and then hope for the best, so... Sidu does have wings up at the moment, so he's smacking these guys for those melee heals. I'm gonna try to get a little bit of damage roll on this Shadow Priest, get a sharpened blade, blade storm out of the Fell Lord, and cleave this entire team down. Now, honestly, I don't think that Arms Warrior Frost Mage is quite as good of a comp as Arms Warrior Fire, just because of the way that you deal damage. Arms is super consistent, Fire is super consistent, but the combined damage of Arms Warrior Bladestorm, followed up by Frost Mage Orb of Frost, really catches these guys off guard and puts them right in the dumpster. <laughs> Honestly, that kill kind of surprised me a little bit. I didn't even have a Sharpened Blade up or anything. I was just like, oh, wow, he's dead. So maybe this excessive pillaring kind of did these guys a disservice, but I'm not mad about it. So that's going to round out our games for this session. It was a lot of fun playing with Venriki and Sita. Both of these guys are really good players, really cool guys, and I'm looking forward to playing more with them at some point in the future. So hope you guys enjoyed the video. Definitely let me know if you enjoy the commentary. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace!